Now I'm going to turn to and in the book of the Acts for my text is going to be in chapter 10. So you have those four gospels in Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and then you have the book of the Acts. And in the book of the Acts, there's some tremendous sermons, and I'm going to preach another man's sermon. That's probably not considered to be a good idea under some circumstances, but it's a good idea to preach from the Bible and the sermons that are there. And this is a sermon that Peter preached. Yes, Peter, the, the apostle Peter that maybe you know someone about. And this is a, a sermon he preached so that people could be saved. And so I'm going to cut right into the middle of it. Acts chapter 10 and verse 34. Acts chapter 10 and verse 34. Then Peter opened his mouth and said, of a truth, I perceive that God is no respecter of persons. But in every nation, he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. The word which God sent unto the children of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. That word, I say, ye know, which was published throughout all Judea and began from Galilee after the baptism which John preached. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. And we are witnesses of all things which he did, both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, whom they slew and hanged on a tree. Him God raised up the third day and showed him openly, not to all the people, but unto witnesses chosen before of God, even to us, who did eat and drink with him, after he rose from the dead. And he commanded us to preach unto the people and to testify that it is he which was ordained of God to be the judge of quick or living and dead. To him give all the prophets witness that through his name, whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission or forgiveness of sins. Get that? Whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins. Now may God bless to us Peter's sermon and what we're going to try to preach to you about it. We're taking up various truths this week, and I've just entitled them Certain Truths in Uncertain Times. And you would understand that there are things going on in this world that make things very uncertain. And if you're like myself, you've received a, a, a lovely, friendly letter from your local power company, just informing you in the most cheerful way possible that they have doubled the rates as of November 1st. And just to, just to add to your misery, you'll probably get another lovely letter from your favorite oil company, who is going to inform you that they've doubled the rates, that they've doubled the price of oil. And if that's not enough, your friendly supermarket will no doubt be sending you a flyer and you'll notice that the numbers are a lot bigger this month than they were last month. Oh, you say, isn't that great? Well, I tell you, the reason why those numbers are going up is because of uncertainties. I don't know if you've noticed there's a bit of a skirmish over there in Eastern Europe and it's created a bit of uncertainty, not to mention a few, maybe a few explosives going on and an underwater pipeline or two. And then don't forget about America. You wouldn't want to forget about America. And their inflation is this and that, and it's not as is expected, it's worse. And everything comes in and you get a bit shaky. Uncertain times. The prime minister of a country not too far away is feeling a little shaky, pulling more U-turns than I have ever done in a car in all my life. And back and forth and all the different things going on. And people say one thing and they say another thing. And everything's all a bit shaky. You wouldn't be surprised if there would be an odd earthquake or two. I've experienced plenty of those. Not in this country, thankfully. I know what it is to be shaken up over there on the Pacific Rim. On both sides of the Pacific Ocean. Your phone lights up telling you you are experiencing an earthquake. As if you didn't know. And there you were, shaking back and forth. Things get uncertain. I like the fact when you land on an airplane, you get down to the earth here, and everything's certain there. 
or the boat comes to the pier and you're just able to disembark and you feel you're on terra firma and you're just there in a bit of a permanent state. But then the ground begins to shake. And you say, where do I go from here? It just could be that there's been an earthquake or two in your own personal experience and you would feel a bit shaken up and you would say, where, where can I plant my faith? Where can I plant my feet? Where can I plant my belief structure? Where do I go for truth? Well, ladies and gentlemen, I go to the Bible. The rock solid anvil of truth where the hammers of skepticism have been worn out beating against it. And I come to the truth of Jesus Christ. And tonight I want to tell you the certain truth that Jesus rose again from the dead. Oh, you say, I hardly believe it. Well, that's why you're here. That's why you're here, actually. Thank you for coming. You say, are you really sure that Jesus rose again from the dead? Well, sometimes I say to people, how do you be sure of anything? I tell you how our courtrooms are filled with, filled with certainties. You say, how did they establish the truth? They go to witnesses. Witnesses. There was an intelligent young fellow at the Valley de Hope school there that I went to last week. And he put up his hands and he said to me, he says, how do you know that Jesus ever existed? And he's not just some sort of man-made figment of someone's imagination. I said, well, I said, do you believe I exist? He says, well, I think so. I said, well, what, on what basis would you go home and tell your parents that I, I personally exist? I've seen you. I've seen you. Ladies and gentlemen, we are reading of a man who saw Jesus Christ. And he didn't just repeat it over and over again. He wrote it down. Peter wrote his own letters. This is, the, this is Luke's writing. And Luke is writing it down. Eyewitnesses of Jesus Christ and his power were able to tell us and they wrote it down. They can submit written testimony. And it wasn't just one. It wasn't just two. It wasn't just three. It wasn't just four. In fact, in fact, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Paul says there was, there was a big conference where Jesus Christ resurrected from the dead showed up. And he was seen of over 500 at once. He says, most of them are still living right now. That's what he said when he was writing that letter. In other words, it was like a challenge saying, go and talk to them. Go and talk to them. And the reason why I'm so glad that I have submitted written evidence is those people have died, but their words live on. They have been inscribed in ink on, no doubt, papyrus. And now we've got them written down and we've repeatedly written them over and over. The printing presses of the world churn out the best selling book in this world every year, the Bible. And so what I have here for you, I want to talk to you about the witness, the witness of Jesus Christ. And then I want to talk to you about the warning. Because there's a warning involved in this. If Jesus Christ is really risen from the dead, then that should strike a note of caution in our minds. Because if he is risen again from the dead, you'll meet him again. He's the one who's able to go into death and come out of death. You'll meet him on both sides of death, friend. The living and the dead will have a judge. It's Jesus. A word of warning. But what I love most of all about preaching the gospel is a word of welcome. There's going to be something in this passage that I have read to you. It's going to be a tremendous welcome to everyone who realizes their sin. It, it would do me no good, friend, to tell you about the mighty power of Christ and the mighty prospect of Christ if I couldn't tell you about the mighty promise of Christ. I am so glad that the man that I preach to you about has a promise that he can give you personally. And that's what I want to end with. But first of all, the witnesses. Peter. James, John, we could march them up to the front, if you will, and say, what do you have to say about the Lord Jesus Christ? Well, what Peter had to say here was that God anointed Jesus of Nazareth 
with the Holy Ghost, with power. He went about doing good. Everybody knows, everybody in the world knows that Jesus went about doing good. Went about doing good. It says he was healing all that were oppressed of the devil. That's even better. And so he did. The blind were able to see. The lame were able to leap. The dumb were able to speak. The deaf were able to hear. And I can hardly believe it, but the dead were raised again by the power of Jesus Christ. I unashamedly preach to you about the power of Christ. Why? Because if I want to preach to him as a savior of your soul, you would understand he has had to prove his power over and over again before I'd be convinced. And I am convinced of the power of Jesus Christ to save me from my sins, to save me from going down to hell. I am convinced of that, but it starts when I look at him when he was here and what he did, what he did. I am so glad that he was mighty in his words, that he was able to look at people and he could see right through them. He could see hypocrisy. There's one thing that we don't like is hypocrites. And the trouble is there's too many of them around. There might even have been a few of us that have snuck into this hall tonight. Hypocrisy. You find it lurking in your own heart and you're ashamed. The Lord Jesus could look right into the hearts of the hypocrites and he could say, woe unto you, you hypocrite. But you know what he was able to do as well? He's able to take a little child on his knee. He says, except you become as a little child, you won't enter into the kingdom of God. He says, suffer the little children to come unto me and forbid them not for of such is the kingdom of God. Little children were not afraid of Christ, but hypocrites ran away when he scolded them. I love the tenderness of Christ. Maybe there's someone here and you don't know yet, but Christ loves you. There's a God in heaven who beams down towards you with a warmer love than the, than the sunshine on County Cork this afternoon. I tell you, what a beautiful country. I don't know. I don't know where it's been all my life. But as I moved in and out of the lanes and inviting people with our brother uh, David, as we invited people to come to the meeting or to listen in online, as we we're just telling them about Christ and giving them the gospel booklet, every curve on the road opened up a more beautiful scene ahead of me. I was absolutely stunned by it. But you know, there's something greater. It's not the scenery, it's the Savior. It's not the loveliness, it's the love. Because it's not always, I hate to break it to the residents of this fair county, it's not always that you see the loveliness like you saw today. All you had to do was go to yesterday, and I predict all we have to do is wait for tomorrow, and it will be totally different. But God's love won't change. God's love for you will not change, not even how bad you are. That's what we learned last night. God hates sin, but he loves the sinner. And that love comes with the beams of his heart. The heartbeat of heaven is to love you, even though you are a sinner. I can hardly take it in. Some of us are loved by some. Even our mothers might love us most of the time. And sometimes some of us have a face that only a mother could love. And you just, and we're just, oh, we're not very lovable. We're just so awkward and, and we don't fit in. But but friend, God loves you no matter what. I can barely take that in. Take it in, will you? The tenderness and the love of the heart of Christ. Let it just melt you. Even if you are hard and cynical and seen too much of, of sin. Let God's lovely son and his love just touch your heart right now. He went about doing good. So he did. And men took him and nailed him to a cross. Nailed him to a cross. Away with this man. It must have been something of the loveliness of Christ that made sinners feel their sin. He was perfect. He was sinless. But there was something about Christ and all of his perfection that made human beings and all of their sin say we want rid of them. I've actually heard it said. I've actually heard it said. 
Jesus lasted three and a half years of public ministry when he was here. He probably wouldn't last three months if he was here in 2022. I don't know what all they based that on. But when I heard that said, it just jolted me. Such is the wickedness of the world. Such is the sinfulness of humanity. That a perfect human being, we just want to discard him. They nailed him to a cross. But it was no surprise to God. God had already planned it. He went about doing good. Man nailed him to a cross and will be held responsible for that. But on that cross, <clears throat> God made the Lord Jesus a sacrifice for our sins. On that cross, here's what the Bible says. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was against him. With his stripes we're healed. Listen to this. The Lord laid upon him the iniquity of us all. And there on that cross, thundering from heaven, when man was unable to even view, the sun has gone out. It's refusing to shine. There were three hours in the daylight where we could see him suffering. There's three hours in the darkness and you can't see him suffering. But I'll tell you this. The Bible tells us why he suffered. He suffered for our sins. And there on that cross, the Lord Jesus Christ suffered for our sins, the just for the unjust, that we might be brought back to God. And you say, isn't that terrible? Isn't that terrible? The sinless Savior dies on a cross. I tell you, it would be terrible if that was the end of the story. People saw him. Peter. John. Eyewitnesses. Of the sufferings of Christ. But they saw something more. In utter shock. In dismay. In disappointment. They went and huddled in all their little places. They'd run away when Christ was taken to be crucified. The, 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 the one that they had followed. They were disciples of. And there he is nailed to the cross. And they saw him put into a tomb. If that was the end of the story, I wouldn't have a salvation to preach to you. But that's not the end of the story. The same ones that saw him crucified were the same ones that saw him alive on the third day. I heard it said once by a man who is not a Christian. That the way the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ in Christianity, the way it spread so rapidly across Europe. In those years, 33, 34, 35, 36, 37, as it just expanded from the Middle East and went straight across the world. He said it had to have been a message that was as shocking as if a man had risen again from the dead. <laughs> Did you get that? In order for the message to spread like that, like wildfire. It had to be as an amazing as if a man had risen from the dead. And I just smiled to myself and thought, well, that's exactly what it was. Jesus Christ rose again from the dead. How do I know? Because witnesses saw him. In fact, Peter just said, eat and drink with him after he rose from the dead. And there he was for 40 days. The book of the Acts tells him for 40 days, the Lord Jesus Christ walked, talked, ate, drank, shared, listened, expounded the Old Testament, taught the disciples 40 days. And on the 40th day, he defies the laws of gravity and just goes right up into the clouds with the promise that he's coming back. They watched him go. Astounding. The man who rose again from the dead, has left us. But he said, he's coming back. And friend, we are between those two amazing events. Between the amazing event of Jesus Christ rising again from the dead and 40 days later ascending. 
and the amazing event when Jesus is coming back. Friend, he's coming back. That's the warning. Witnesses saw him, wrote it down. People that heard him wrote it down. That's why I believe it. I believe the witness. Do you? Are you willing to believe the eyewitness testimony? Of the man who was slain and hung on a tree and the third day rose again? The warning to you is he's coming back as judge. What a warning. You say, I don't believe it. Could I be quite gentle as I say this? Whether you believe it or not won't change it. Your belief and faith will change you. But it will not change the facts. You could stand up here and you could say, I do not believe that the Sanford, the Golden Gate Bridge is across that bay in San Francisco. You can say, I don't believe it, friend. Don't believe it. But it doesn't change it. I've been on it. In fact, in 1939, it was opened on my birthday. Well, you say, when's your birthday? Go to the San Francisco Bridge and look at the plaque and you'll see. I wasn't born in 39, just slightly after that. But I tell you this, friend, whether you believe it exists or not doesn't change the facts. And it should just chill your bones right now. If you've been defiant against Christ and defiant against God and have not bowed, I will assure you that the same Bible that tells us he rose again is the same Bible that says he's coming again. And he's going to come. It says here, he commanded us to preach unto the people, verse 42, to testify that it is he which was ordained of God to be judge of living and dead. It should enter into my heart with a great deal of solemnity that if I defy and deny Christ, he will come as my judge. He will meet me where I am. Will you say, if I die, is that the end? No, friend, it's actually just the beginning. The sad reality is there's many a person who, in defiance and rebellion against God, has entered into eternity to meet the God they said never existed. To meet the God who will be the judge and all judgments committed to Christ. You see, friend, on that great white throne of those final pages of our Bible, when a sentencing will be meted out, there will be a man who will sit there. Dare I say, he'll have the marks of Calvary. The nail prints in his hands and in his feet, will they still be there? I don't read of them ever healing over. That the man who sits on yonder throne to be the judge is the man who died for our sins on the cross and rose again. And you read the Bible and it's one complete story of grace. <laughs> we have sinned against God. Maybe there's someone here and you would feel your sin just now. You would feel I have sinned against God. I hope you do feel that. That's actually what I want you to feel. I, I want you to know from the Bible, not only that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, but that you personally have sinned against God and be like the prodigal son who said, I have sinned. I have sinned against heaven. To be like that man in Luke chapter 18 that the Lord Jesus told us about. He was just a mere tax collector and he goes up to pray at the temple and he stands afar off and he just beats his chest. He says, God, be merciful. He begins to pray. Doesn't pray about what he's done. There was another man down the way. He was a Pharisee and he was telling God, how lucky that God was to have him in his kingdom. And I do this and I do that. And I'm like, I'm like so good. And I'm not like this publican over here. And that poor publican tax collector. He just smites his breast and says, as if to say, oh God, the problem's here. He says, God, be merciful to me, the sinner. It's me. We song we used to sing as children. It's me. It's me, oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. It's me, it's me. Friend, it's you. You're the sinner. And I've got great news for you. You're the sinner. 
that Christ had on his heart when he was on that cross. You're the sinner, but Christ is the Savior. And he proved that he's the Savior by rising again from the dead. But if you do not accept him as your Savior, you'll have no choice but to meet him as your judge. He's the son of God who died and rose again. I want to just get to my welcome before I close. Please understand, friend, as I would warn you that Christ is coming back again and warn you that he'll be your judge. Can I tell you right now, the same hands, nail-pierced hands, are extended to you right now in a welcome. Because listen to this. Through his name, whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins. The problem is sin. The solution is the Savior. And I just long that a sinner and the Savior will come together tonight. But you believe on him. It's him who died in my place. Oh, it's he who has suffered for me. It's the Savior for me, the sinner. I believe him. You say, that's far too simple. Really? Don't tell Christ the cross was simple. Don't tell God that giving his well-beloved son to die in our place was simple. It's profound. That's what it is. That the creator takes upon himself human flesh to meet the need of the creature. The creature that's rebellious against him. The creator and the creature are brought together when the creator became man and died in his place. And died for him. Died for the sinner. And rose again to prove that it's done. It's, it's, it's sufficient. It, it satisfied God. God says, I am pleased with the death of my son. And raised him again from the dead. So that whosoever believeth. Whosoever. I know that's an archaic word, isn't it? We would say whoever. But I love the word whosoever. Because whatsoever you've done. And whosoever you might be. If you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you'll be forgiven of your sins. The reason why I think this is such a tremendous message is because, first of all, we're all sinners. So this is a universal message. Did you not get that at the beginning? Every nation. Doesn't matter where you're from. Doesn't matter, friend, what you've done. I can assure you from the word of God. And this is why I preach it in different countries and in different languages. I can look a man in Japan in the eye and say, the death of Christ is for a poor sinner like you. I can look an American in the eye and say, the death of Christ is for a poor sinner like you. And I can come right here to county court. And I can assure you that whosoever believeth in him. I wonder if someone's going to bow just now. Recognizing the great power of Christ to bear sin's awful load. To die and to rise again. To recognize that prospect. That Christ is the, is the grand ruler of the universe. And he's coming back again to be judged. And just to recognize that promise. If he said that we're <laughs> to preach. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish. But have everlasting life. That's a promise. I wonder if you can believe the power. Acknowledge the prospect and accept the Savior for yourself. Jesus rose again from the dead. Friend, that changes everything. That convinces me. I need to believe on him. Oh, the tremendous, the tremendous privilege it is for me to tell you that there is a warm welcome awaiting you. If you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, God says, I'll receive you as a child of my own. And you're saved. May you do so. May you trust the Lord Jesus. Turn to him. Acknowledge what he's done is for, for you, the sinner. And when you believe on him, you will receive forgiveness of sins. Now that's a promise. Let us pray. Our Father. In the name of the Lord Jesus, we give thee our humble thanks for such a glorious message that we have to preach concerning thy son. We thank thee for his power that he rose again. We thank thee for the prospect that he's coming again. And we thank thee, Father, for the promise that someone 
if they believe on him now, that they'll have their sins forgiven and be right with thee forever. Father, bless thy word to each person. Here we pray in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.